Hi, this is Sandy Hudson with Unlock the PPO. You are watching The Best Practices Show. Hey guys, thanks for watching The Best Practice Show. We take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And if you're growing a dental practice and you're making yourself crazy with write-offs and all these PPOs and you're looking at a way to reduce the PPOs, I have got the expert today, Sandy Hudson. You do not want to miss this. She's like our coach. We This is the woman I go to. I mention her all the time in the seminars and I got her on the show today. It took forever, but I finally got her. And she is a master. She is awesome. You're going to love Love this and truly an expert on how to navigate this whole PPO environment. And she's going to share some incredible stuff. So do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. You're going to love this. Now, a couple show notes. We are shooting this live on Facebook like we always do. So if you're watching this and you have a question, add it to the feed and I'll ask I'll ask Sandy directly while we have her on the show and we'll get the answer from her right right here right now. Also, if you're watching these later on, you have questions, continue to add questions to the feed because we want you to get the most out of this. Another thing I'm going to encourage you to do is take these videos and share them with your team because a lot of doctors say, oh, that was great, but the team members get left in the dark. They have to know what's going on too. We want you guys to get the most out of this when you're when you're watching all these. Um, thank you again for all the shares and all the suggestions. We got quite a few of them um, right now with everything. This is our 203rd episode, Sandy. So thank you so much for being on. Over 39,000 followers on Facebook and 150,000 of you have watched or listened on iTunes and we don't have anything to say other than thank you. So appreciate all that guys. Now, my guest today, Sandy Hudson, she has a little company called Unlock the PPO. And again, I just can't say enough about this woman because she is truly a voice of reason. She's one of those people where if I'm struggling to figure this out, and again, we do this all the time, working with dental practices, helping them get healthier all the way around. And when we get stuck on how complex insurance is, this is our expert. So Sandy, thank you so much for being on today. I'm so excited. It's fun to talk with you. It's been a while. So it's it great. has. Yeah. It has. Now, I always like to talk about the why before we get in the how. Today, we're going to be talking about how you can reduce your PPO write-offs, but give us kind of like a state of the union before we go in, into the details. Yeah. Well, I think everybody's just very challenged with how do I make this work? You know, for most, I would guess most of our audience today has some degree of PPO contracts in place, but what they're finding is what I originally signed up for a few years ago or a decade or two ago is just not what I'm getting anymore. So all of these agreements have just kind of expanded and exploded. And now everybody's going, I'm not exactly sure what I even have in place anymore or what I'm getting paid what with. And it's just gotten way more complex. And it's not that the dentist really changed things on their end. It's that all of these agreements have started to encompass way more than what they originally did. So now it's just stepping back and saying, let's just take a fresh look at all of this. What do I need? What do I not need anymore? What's working for me? And how do I start to look at things to where I'm, um, I'm constantly figuring out what's working for me and what's not and tweaking it as you go. You can't just sign things and leave them in place anymore. You just have to start watching things a lot more closely. Yeah. And Sandy, there, here's the reason you have to watch this show, because some of you might think, well, I'm on, I'm fee for service. This isn't important to me. There's usually three classifications, uh, fee for service practices that are considering adding PPOs. We're going to share some thoughts that you have. You have uh, people that are on PPOs and they're way too busy. So should they eliminate a few of them? You might fit that category. A third category you might have is you have these PPOs. Now, how do we maneuver and reduce our, P our write-offs, correct? Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And, and some of it is setting a good, like if you're fee for service, how do you set initial contracts? Well, as well as if you happen to be, we didn't really talk about this, but what if you're doing a startup and you've got a fresh slate, my business partner, Lisa, she handles all of the work with our startup clients. So everybody then has just a fresh slate. You can pick it how you want to, but for the majority of probably who's watching today is probably more established practices who have PPOs in place. And then it's more a matter of figuring out how do I get paid better on what I already have? Or is it time to maybe get out of a couple of these? And if so, what's the best way to look at doing that? Right. And one of the th climate changes is called shared agreements. And you yeah. went through the details with us a couple of weeks ago and we were all like, oh my gosh. So <laughs> give us kind of the climate with what, first of all, what are they and yeah. how, how do they work? Sure. So if you have a direct contract with a company, it means you, as it sounds like, you sound directly with them, signed directly with them. So if you have a direct contract with Cigna or Guardian or Aetna or whoever, it means you actually signed a contract directly with that insurance company. Now, it used to be that a direct contract always took priority, meaning if you sign a direct contract with this company, no matter what, that's how you're going to get paid for those patients. That's true still with most companies, but not all. So there can be cases now where you signed a contract directly with an insurance company and that's not how you're getting paid on that contract anymore. Then there's shared network agreements, which means you signed an agreement with somebody else, but that other contract has agreements with all, potentially lots and lots of other insurance companies and they can pick you up on an in-network basis and pay on their fee schedule instead of the direct fee schedule. So meaning everybody out there now, with the exception of Delta, has shared network agreements with other companies. If you want to be in network with Delta, you got to sign direct. There's no other choices. But everybody else out there has at least part of their networks through these shared network agreements. So what you have to do is be careful that when you're signing something, is that what you intended to get based on all of the other companies they could pick up? Or did you sign something and you got a whole bunch of junk with it that you never really intended to get? So as long as you're, it's not that they're necessarily good or bad, they could work to your advantage or your disadvantage, but you have to just be very careful that you are the one controlling what you get. Because if you leave it in the insurance company's hands, there's a good chance you're going to start getting paid less and less. And your goal is to get paid more and more. So you have to, they work both directions. So you have to be a little careful with what you get with those. Yeah, and this is perfectly legal. They can do this, and they have been doing this, and dentists don't often read the fine print, and do they have to let you know within 30 days? I mean, how did, how would this happen yeah. where I would be direct and all of a sudden I'm unshared? Does it happen to most dentists or like, I didn't even know that? Yes, Is that and Yes. And the thing that most dentists don't realize is that most, not all, but a lot of those shared network agreements, you have the ability to opt out of. But the burden is on you to opt out. <clears throat> if you don't opt out, you automatically get opted in. So it should be the opposite. It should be that as these new agreements are made, somebody should be asking the dentist, can we fold you into this? That's not it. You're getting automatically folded in. Your job is to decide, do you want it or not? And if you don't, the burden is on you to opt out. Now, where there gets to be some confusion is we use the term opt out, a lot of times that's confusing with the termination. An opt-out and a termination are different things. If you terminate a contract, you're actually terminating your contract in its entirety, meaning if you're contracted with whoever, guardian, and you send a termination letter to them, you are then eliminating your entire guardian contract. An opt-out is different. For example, Guardian has an, has an agreement now, it's pretty new, um, with United Healthcare. So if you have a contract with Guardian, and let's say that's it. Let's say you have a practice and the only contract you have is with Guardian. No other contracts. Well, that shared network agreement now allows Guardian to pick up United Healthcare. So it means now all of a sudden one day you're in network with United Healthcare under the Guardian fee schedule. You didn't sign anything with United Healthcare. Nobody asked for your permission. They just said, "We now have this new shared network agreement." Now you're in network with both Guardian and United Healthcare under the Guardian contract. You have the ability to opt out of that. An opt out is different than a termination. 
you're still keeping your guardian contract, but you are sending a letter to guardian saying, hey, we don't want to be involved in this shared network agreement. We want to opt out of your agreement with United Healthcare. That keeps your guardian contract in place for your guardian patients, just like what you intended. But it tells guardian, you can't pull United Healthcare in network. So that's the difference between the two things is the difference between an opt out and a termination. You just have to be careful that you're doing the right thing with what your end goal is, but you do have the ability to opt out of most of those. Yeah. So this just sounds like you're going to have these proactive, like parasites just (laughs) clinging to your body and you're, you're not even going to know them. You're just going to have to set up a regular cleaning just every week or every month to just evaluate, to get them off because- no one's even telling you they're coming. Now, can you help us understand why insurances would be doing shared agreements? I think that's a big thing to just get out on the table because mm-hmm. they're not doing this to say, hey, look, let's really make sure we get dentist top dollar for this. And I mean, I'm, I'm kind of leading the question, but why are insurance okay. companies doing this? Well, it's just a way to get more dentist in network without having to go through necessarily directly contracting everyone. So like that's a good example of all of a sudden you're now in network with United Healthcare even though you never signed anything with United Healthcare. And that's just one example. I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying everybody has them. So it's a way to where you, they don't have to necessarily hunt you down, have a, an actual contract sign. Now all of a sudden you're in network. You remember, if they pick you up through a shared network agreement, even though you never signed anything, you're still on that company's website. So let's go back to that and say, use that Guardian example. Guardians picked up United Healthcare. You're now on the United Healthcare website. You're listed as a provider. So you, the patient has no way of knowing that you never signed anything with them. You're getting it via an agreement with somebody else, but you're still listed on that company's website as a provider. Now, Again, that works both directions. So let's just say that your guardian contract is a great fee schedule. Well, actually, that may not be a bad thing for you because now Mm -hmm. you're going to get some new patient flow and it's a fee schedule you are already happy with or you wouldn't have signed it in the first place probably. That might actually work to your benefit. For the most part, though, you have to remember... These are being used more so probably for the insurance company's benefit than the dentist. You have to be very strategic because the insurance company's motivation is to pull in lots and lots of dentists. As they're selling policies, they can say, here's our big network, but they didn't actually have to get you to agree to assign a contract in order to list you as a provider. So you know, again, these it's not that they're good or bad. It's just that you have to decide does that shared network agreement work for your practice's goals or does it not? And if it does not, you got to be watching that and be sure that you get yourself out of those when they happen. Because a lot of times you're not even going to get a notice. The only way you are going to know when it happens is if that company now is in network on an EOB. Well, that's hard. I mean, people are busy in dental practices. They can't just all of a sudden one day say, wait a second, last week we were getting paid on this fee schedule. Now we're getting paid on this fee schedule. What just happened? I mean, people are busy actually taking care of patients. So thinking you're going to catch something just because it came through on an EOB, that's a pretty tall order for most staff to be, you know, keeping track of. Totally agree. So, well, let's say I'm a 32 year old dentist and I'm watching this and my brain hurts like mine does right now. I'm like, Sandy, <laughs> yeah, I know. okay. I hear what you're saying, but I practice in Texas and I've got 2000 patients on PPO. Like where would I start? Yep. What yep. would you say to a 32 year old dentist who's watching this? Who's like probably overwhelmed at this point. Give me like a yep. process that doesn't take well, me to the dentist side. Yeah. And, and I will tell you, it, it is exhausting. I mean, I, a part of it is acknowledging this is the world you now live in. And so uh, it really is a tiring piece of a dental practice that didn't used to exist. And so it's a new thing that you really have to look at much differently. And 10 years ago, this was not something that we even, you know, did with practices to the same degree. So I'll tell you what we do. And this is something that I mean, obviously we do it for people who don't want to do it, but these are things that every dentist can do on their own. It's just a matter of, do you want to take the time or not? But this is something all dentists need to realize, hey, you can do this. It's just time consuming. But what we look at in our process that can be replicated, you know, by a dentist who's at least wanting to eyeball their numbers a little bit 
is what are your top codes? Okay, what's relevant? Looking through every procedure you've done is not relevant. You want to know what are the top, usually it's about 30 codes for that will make up 90% of an office's production. So just narrow it down. That's going to be what's truly relevant to your practice. Based on that, you can just go side by side. That's what we do is a really a one page snapshot of the practice to say, here's your top codes. Here's how often you build out each of those codes for the last year. And based on that, here's your best paying fee schedule down to your worst paying fee schedule. So you're looking at just a comparison of here's a dozen fee schedules. Um, how do they stack up and what are your write-offs with each one? So that's our starting point to say, this is the impact the insurance companies are having on you right now. Okay. Now the question, wait, wait. I got yes. one more. I got one question. Cause when you showed me this, I'm like, that is brilliant because <laughs> the way it's been done, even as it's gotten more complex is dentists organize it by plan. So they usually take a look at each plan and just spend all their time saying, what's this plan pay? You're looking at it as purely data. We're going to take a look at how mm -hmm. much you're doing in each one of these codes and then evaluate it after that. Yeah, because it's a weighted average. You know, right. it doesn't, the things you, if you're going to bill out, you know, a thousand exams, but only 15 dentures, those are not weighted equally. So the impact of a particular fee schedule is going to depend on truly not just what did you do the most of, but how often did you <clears throat> bill out each code? You guys see why she's so brilliant? Like I, <laughs> I, I'm always on a delay well, with you. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. But it takes me like five seconds to cut, get caught up to what you're even talking about. So, all right. So after we've got the top codes, we know how often we build them out. Mm -hmm. And we have good data on that. Where do I go next? Mm -hmm. Well, then <clears throat> you want to go, first of all, figure out, is anybody willing to give you some increases? Because the, the easiest thing to do is keep something that you have in place now and just get paid more for what you're doing. So, it, you know, when you start eliminating contracts and moving things around, that is a process in and of itself and nothing is super easy. So with everything that you're doing, there's a trade-off. One is going to be, how do you get paid the most? And the other piece of it is, what is what's the easiest? It, it's not common that the path that pays you the most will be the easiest. And so you kind of have to decide what's your priority. And, and the priority is different for different practices. If you are somebody who is a just what you said, a 32 year old dentist, I'm still growing. I'm, you know, I got uh, some years ahead of me here. Um, you kind of got to find that balance. Maybe what is a little bit easier right now, even if it's not the very highest paying path, there's some trade off with that. If you're a 50 year old dentist and you're going, you know what, I'm not ready to retire, but guess what? My, my financial situation is a lot more comfortable. I'm kind of done dealing with some headaches. I can afford to just say no thanks, you might go with something, you, you might take a little different path. So it's, you know, and as you know, we work with a lot of clients, both of us do, who have different stages of life that require different plans at different times. So there is no right or wrong answer to all of this. It's just figuring out what's the best, <clears throat> sorry, the best path for you with where you're at right now. So, you know, let's map that out. But first of all, the easiest thing is if you've got a contract with Aetna or Cigna or Guardian or whoever, Humana, take your pick. If you can keep it and just get an increase on what you're already doing, that will always be the easiest path. The contract's already in place. You're not changing anything other than the fee schedule itself. So give that a shot first. Let's get everybody's best offers on the table and say, now that we can see everything, now we, we know here's everybody's final offers. What makes sense to keep? What makes sense to discuss? Is this really workable? And then... The question is, if you eliminate something, this is where you got to be careful. If you've got some bottom payers, this doesn't even make any sense. I'm looking at something that's paying me less than half of my fee, and I have patients booking out for three weeks. Why am I doing that? That that Now that you see it on paper, you go, that actually doesn't make sense. Um, why not book out one week in advance instead of three weeks in advance and get rid of something that you're writing off half of half of your fee with? So how do we start to just identify, well, where's a good starting place? But here's where you have to be careful. If you eliminate something, back to these whole shared network agreements, if you eliminate something and you have any third-party administrator, Connection Dental, Dentamax, um, Carrington, 
Zealous, which used to be, and Maverist is one that people used to have a place but was bought out by Zealous. Certain areas have regional ones, um, like the Midwest has Premier Group. Um, California has First Dental Health. There's other smaller ones as well. Every one of those is a huge network that can pick up 50 companies under their umbrella. So if you eliminate something and you have one of those shared network agreements in place, it doesn't matter what you drop. Somebody else is sitting there ready to pick them back up again. Now, if they're going to pick them up at a rate that you're like, okay, well, I could live with that if that happens, then that's fine. But if you have a direct contract and you eliminate it and you've got a lower paying shared network agreement, you actually eliminated something that you thought you were getting rid of. But it turns out there's just somebody else there ready to pick back up again and they're going to pay you even less than what you had in place with your contract you just terminated. <laughs> so right. you got to be really careful that you're not just isolating one thing you think isn't working. You've got to step back and say, how do all of these contracts, how are they all intermingled? It's a big web. And you have to understand how those all work before you drop something, not after. Yeah. And to your point, I think one of the things that has to be said clearly is you can't do this emotionally because a lot of dentists will take a look at this and they get very emotional. They get angry and they go, just write the letter. I get these calls, Sandy, and people go, yeah. I'm done with that company. I just sent the letter. I'm like, well, how many patients? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, that's not a good answer. Do you know what I mean? Like they don't know. And what you're talking about is no different than Major League Baseball. You're making really good decisions on how you play the game based on data here. Now, I have so many questions. You let's go back. You said the easiest way is if you can increase your reimbursement, stay on them. But are there a few that you can't? There's just no way, or are all of? Can you negotiate with almost every one of them? Can you give us some clarity on that? Yes, we say, and this is very general, but in general, the four typical non-negotiable companies are Delta, MetLife. Blue Cross in most states, but not all, and United Concordia. Now, there's exceptions. So don't, don't assume that every one of those four is always going to be non-negotiable. But I say that up front because if you're looking at outsourcing this as a project, if you're looking at your numbers and you're saying, hey, let's go hire a company like us to do this for you, we want to be super upfront that the vast, vast, vast majority, those are going to be non-negotiable. So you're getting those off of the table. So you just don't want to pay somebody to go deal with an insurance company that the reality is it's probably not going to look any different than what you have right now. Now, that doesn't mean you maybe want to keep, you might need to make some changes with that company, but you want to be kind of realistic. So those would be the four least likely companies to do any negotiations. Um, there are some exceptions and, and we're seeing some more so like, you know, United Concordia used to be pretty much always non-negotiable. Um, we're seeing some movement with them in places we haven't seen before. So there's there's pockets where, hey, if they need somebody, you're going to have some leverage that you wouldn't normally see in certain areas. So there, it's all dependent upon, upon, excuse me, the market, certainly. But just in general, that's not where you want to spend the majority of your time because they're going to be the least likely to probably make a move. They're more tied to your zip code than they are custom negotiable like we might see with some other companies. Yeah. Now I need you like for four hours because I have so many questions because you're so brilliant. <laughs> but I want to go back to what you were talking about before too. You said, so let's say I do the metrics. I find out which procedures I'm doing the most and billing out. Then I'm also negotiating with those that I can. Now let's say I'm just kind of stuck with a few. You were pointing to scheduling. You said scheduling out one week. The point is this. You don't want to just flood your schedule with every mm -hmm. insurance. You mm -hmm. can control the flow in, correct? I mean, and then right. the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to couple that with a a second question that I often get, isn't that illegal if you control the inflow? Because these contracts say you have to treat these patients like every other patient. So I get these questions all the time. So I'm going to addition to you. What would you say to those two? Can I control the inflow? And then yeah, secondly, oh, how do I fall in line with that wording on that contract that's written by million dollar attorneys? 
Well, you're not required to see patients you don't want to see, certainly. So you have to be you have to be fair in how you do it. But what that means, though, is most companies will allow you to say, we want to keep our contract, but we don't want to take any new patients. So that check to see if that's an option. If so, they'll probably even note it for you on the website so that you're not just even continuing to get a bunch of calls for a plan that you've already decided. Like maybe it's a case where we've got this, you know, group of patients with this plan. We know it's not cost effective. We're choosing to take it because it's my church's plan or it's there's some reason you're taking it outside of it. Maybe on paper doesn't make as much sense, but you're taking it for other reasons. But you just don't want to keep getting new patients from it. So you can usually tell the insurance company, can you just say we're not taking any new patients? You're just going to keep the ones you have. That's it. Um, but also just when is it time to actually eliminate a whole plan and just say this, this just doesn't make sense anymore where there's this sense of, and you know, it makes sense. Dentists spend all of this time building their practices to take care of people well, to, you know, spend all of this time where their staff is accommodating patients and growing the practice and how do we retain patients. And then you do that year after year after year. And then all of a sudden you realize, hold on a second, I don't have the ability to get in a new patient maybe for four weeks or four months. I mean, there's, there's cases where it's like, we have absolutely nowhere to put new patients. So it's identifying, well, when are we at this place where all we're doing is booking patients out further and further? That does you no good. I mean, the only thing you can do is see one full day of patients at a time. That's it. Booking out four weeks instead of two days, how does that help anybody? All you're doing is delaying production. And the problem is that once you realize that you're in some of these lower plans, when you just think about it, there's going to be far fewer dentists participating with the lower paying options in your area than the higher paying options. So guess what happens? You get if flooded. Some crappy plan that nobody's taking except for you and the office down the road that's, you know, hired 17 associates in the last year that have just rotated through. Well, of course they're going to choose you. So now that the, the part where you're booking out you know, four weeks instead of one week, you're just building this backlog of patients who are the lowest paying option and are creating a backlog where now the higher paying option patients can't even get in to see you anymore. So there's this point then where all of that work you've spent building your practice, you have to step back and say, I know we have spent all of this time building, building, building. We need to shrink. And that's a really hard thing because it's an emotional thing, like you, like you said. It is. It is. I'm actually going to tell patients to go away. That is contrary to what every dentist has, has done for their entire career. But you have to recognize when is it time to shrink the practice a little bit and start collecting what you're worth, even if that means a piece of you know, those, those patients actually go away. That's, that's a healthy shrinking, not a bad thing. Now, if you're going to do that and you're going to create open chair time, that's a different story. We don't want open chair time because as much as we hate to say it, a $700 crown is better than an empty chair. I mean, mm -hmm. we have to realize where are we at a place where that's not quite where we're at yet. Right. That's the goal someday and know when you've hit that point, but now is maybe not the time to drop. But we have just as many dentists who should be dropping plans and don't think they can than are in that situation. So you just have to really know, hey, why are we running crazy? And, and for dentists, you have to protect the dentist, the, the dentist themselves. You can hire as many hygienists and as many assistants and as many front office staff. There's one dentist and that dentist can only delegate so much. So when you hit this critical mass, that's just more weight that falls to them. There's a point that they cannot delegate anymore. And dentistry is a hard gig. I mean, I'm, I'm married to a dentist. There is a limited capacity of how much one person can do before. I mean, it's physically difficult. It's mentally difficult. I mean, this is a tough gig. So somebody has to also just be protecting the dentist to say, this is all you can do with this amount of patients. We have to capitalize on 
what you can handle in a profitable way, not just putting them on a hamster wheel while they're running, 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 while somebody's paying $600 for a crown. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And so my anxiety is way up right now. And I love what you just said <laughs> because, well, a couple of things, there's a couple of things that you just said that I really think are very important. So many dentists go to design seminars and they come back and they build a nine operatory. I'm like, why did you just build a nine operatory practice? Well, that's the direction practice is going. And I'm like, well, you're going to need another dentist. Now, let me say this. If you're watching this and you've ever hired an associate, you raise your hand if you think, oh, hiring an associate's easy. They're easy. You hire one, they stay forever. No, you know, this is, this is like a transplant. Some organs take, most don't in some cases. It's mm -hmm. terrible, but that's the state of the union with associates. Mm -hmm. It's not for sure. And you're building a business model just because you... Uh, I'll just say this. When you build a chair, you will never see an empty chair for what Sandy just said. So you'll put the 700 crown that'll eventually be the $600 crown that'll eventually, eventually be the $500 crown. And then you got to pick up the slack when that associate goes, I don't know if I want to live in this town anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So let me just say that. Um, the other thing, and I lost what I thought because I'm just so... Well, like, while you're thinking on that, let me ahead, take you back off of that because... Uh, you and I both talk to a lot of dentists and I don't know what, what you've seen. You talk to more people than I do. So I'm just telling you kind of the, what I perceive as a shift about two, three, four years ago. That's all I heard. All I heard was multiple locations, multiple associates, a lot of talk about, do I even ever want to practice dentistry or am I just going to keep opening offices and hiring people? And it was almost like this new thing where, where you kind of wondered, is anybody going into dentistry to actually take care of patients or has it switched to just be, this is a business and how many locations can I add? And it had this sort of feel like if you're not doing that and your goal isn't to eventually have four or six offices, what are you thinking? And I am seeing a shift in that, um, which I'm happy to see. And it's not to say that people who want multiple locations, that's wrong, but but there's lots of ways to do this. And the thought that more, 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 more is better, um, where we see tons of profitable, very solid practices are not ones who keep adding, adding, adding. They're doing what they're doing really well. And our experience, I don't know what yours is, is that it is very hard to take something and multiply it into additional locations without really watering things down along the way. And we don't work with multiple locations anymore for that reason. Even an office that only has one extra location, we won't touch those anymore just because I get it. I know there's somebody out there right now saying th this is not the case for them. And they're, I'm sure they're right. But our experience is that the more locations, the bigger of a mess that we found. And trying to clean up just one location is hard enough with what we do, M you know, extrapolating that out into multiple locations is much harder is what we found. And so it's not to say it can't be done, but I do think that the trend with that, I'm seeing it pull back a little bit and dentists realizing I can get just as much what I of what I want out of a one doctor location as I could with multiple ones. And they're, they're starting to shift a little bit in that again, I think. Yeah. And we're seeing exactly that too, Sandy. So you have to listen to what this woman is saying, because I would say this time is the new rich. I find dentists, they'll make a little bit more money adding 10 more employees in another location. But I'm finding once you make a certain amount of money, any additional money doesn't bring you happiness. What brings you happiness mm -hmm. is now you have more control. So Sandy, we have hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of practices that have transitioned from eight to five to seven to three. And then they play with what we call the dials. They dial this, they dial that. They just play with the dials until it's congruent with their core values. And like, this is the type of practice I've always dreamed of. I like having one conversation at a time. Then they can play with their fees, get rid of the crazy right. patients. And some of them like small, like I like simple. I, I have 16 employees. Like I don't want 32. That sounds mm -hmm. terrible. Do you know what I mean? I love my 16. I'll take care of them. Let's yep. do some fun stuff. Let's pay them what, but like the whole idea of adding more, I totally agree with you. And the whole idea, there's a lot of talk everywhere I go. Everyone's talking about multiples of even, oh, I'm banding together with this other person and we're going to yes. get 
like 15 times EBITDA. I'm like, where are you hearing this? Because I don't see any of that anywhere. Now, somebody might be watching this going, hey, we're getting that. That's great. But there are so few people that can pull that off. I mean, we're talking about 1% of dentistry that can do that really well. And it's, they are entrepreneurs. They and really exactly. gifted ones. Yeah. And they know how to scale business. Now, let me go back to one other thing that I want to say, because I have to ask you this. You mentioned you can limit the flow, kind of, of the new patients in your practice. You were talking about as a practice deciding, look, we're only going to book new patients two weeks. Now, what are, are you saying this? Let's determine the number of new patients we've got for those two weeks. I want most of them to be fee for service, highly referred. And we're going to keep a few spaces for these less desirable insurances. Is that kind of what I heard or is that what you would suggest? Well, we don't, to be honest, we don't get into that piece of it of once you decide what you're taking, how do you actually manage that on your schedule? That's a little bit outside of our, you know, range, but I would say, yes, at least manage that. If you're going to have 10 new patient appointments open and you're going to fill them with, if, if you're seeing, well, nine of those were filled in three days because I'm getting all these calls of people who can't get in anywhere else. Somebody has to just be, I think more so identifying that and saying that that doesn't make sense. Uh, it, it just does not make sense to continue to fill. The other thing that we do get is we see, and this is back a little bit to what we were talking about, about the associate piece. And this is something I still get tons of questions on. So I'll throw this out. Mm -hmm. What if you're a one doctor practice, you kind of got four or five PPOs. Okay. So you got a limited amount. You're right in the 900,000 to million dollar mark. So you're busy, you're profitable. You, you're not sitting around. Now you're thinking it's time to hire somebody. I'm kind of sick of this gig four days a week. I need to get somebody in. This is where we start having some conversations about PPOs as well, because here's the next conversation is that dentist is really not ready for an associate unless it's just what you said. Are they buying time? Do they want time? If they want time, then that's great. They can cut back to three days a week, give one day a week to an associate, and they're just shifting how they you know, map out their hours. But if what they're doing is saying, okay, I want an associate and they go hire somebody three or four days a week, that practice cannot support two dentists. And so a lot of times the first thought is, well, how about if I add in a few more PPOs? And then that's what we'll use to keep the associate busy. Let me just give a couple of thoughts on that because that's happening Please. a lot. Everywhere. Um, yep. <laughs> everywhere. So a couple of things is then you have to decide are you going to do split participation? Meaning here you are, you're 50, 55 years, years old. You've stayed out of network with a lot of these companies. Do you want to go in network with your associate or are you just doing this so your associate has some new patient flow? So that in and of itself is one decision. Most insurance companies do allow split participation, meaning one dentist can participate, one can choose not to. Okay, so you've decided that's my game plan. I'm going to hire an associate and I'm going to add on a couple of PPOs to try to get them busy. But here's where that gets tricky in the beginning. You have to have a dentist who is adding into that PPO. So you, you cannot add that PPO into your quote practice so that you spend three months getting in network in theory, now you go hire somebody and now you add them on. See, there has to be a dentist personally attached to those. So if you as the owner are not going to actually go in network, just the associate, you've got to hire the associate, then add them actually on those plans. Okay. So that does not happen as we all know overnight. By and the, the second they leave, they take the plan with them. Now there's nobody left to see those patients. So you hire an associate, you hope it works out, just like you said, now it's the organ thing, is it going to take or not? So you've got, let's say, six months before you've looked at all the insurance companies, you've determined which ones are going to be the right fit, you've filled out all the applications, now the insurance company's got to process them and actually get that name added onto the website. Okay, six months later, that associate's been sticking around and there's no actual new patient flow coming. So now you've hired somebody and they're not busy enough. 
by the time those contracts become in place, I have had multiple offices where that associate has already moved on somewhere else because you did not have the patient flow to support them. You can't create that proactively. Now, if you as the owner are adding, that's fine because you're getting tied to them then you're adding an associate on. But if you're adding in PPOs just to justify hiring an associate, that's a very tricky game plan. The other thing you have to remember when you do that, so owner dentist, you're out of network with MetLife, okay? It's a big write-off. You've chosen not to do it. You add an associate. Well, we're going to let the associate go and network with MetLife. That'll generate a bunch of new patient flow. Then the big unknown is what happens to the $200,000 of production that you're doing every year out of network with MetLife when all of those patients realize you now have an associate who they'd be in network with. So what happens to the shift of patients internally within the practice when you're going to give all of those patients who were paying, you know, $1,100, $1,200 for a crown now they can get it for $700 by seeing your associate. What does that do to the practice? So that whole adding PPOs just for an associate, I would just say it's not that it can't work, but be really realistic before you hire somebody with that as your main game plan. Yeah. And let me just pause there. We tell dentists all the time and we're coaching your practice has to be a reflection of who you want it to be, not a business model that you've heard on a podcast or that's working because mm -hmm. that's the worst thing to do because you wake up one day and you go, this isn't yep. me and you're yes. working just to work. You know what I mean? Yep. The second thing that I want to ask you about on that exact thing, let's say I see this all the time, Sandy, I'm sure you do. Young dentists come to me and they go, yeah, I just bought a Delta Premier practice. I go, well, the yep. dentist was a Delta Premier. You are not, my friend. And they go, no, I paid a lot of money for it. And my rep says I am. I'm like, your rep has no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Is that true or not true? So yes, yeah, so you got to be really careful. And if I and, and people looking at buying practices, you cannot afford to make a mistake on this. Mm -hmm. So let's use California as an example, just because they were the number one state to start this. This is where it all began. So you're you're buying a practice from somebody who is with Delta. And this is more relevant for practices, obviously, who are who are the less PPO participation in a practice that you're buying, the more you need to be super aware of this. Because if they're already in network with D Delta PPO and you know that's what you're buying, then that's fine. But if you're buying a practice where the seller is Delta Premier only and they are not with PPO, those are the ones you have got to absolutely critically know what you're buying. Because it's just what you said. If a doctor is with Premier and you cannot get that fee schedule once you buy the practice, then the difference, and this varies on a state-by-state -state basis, but the difference between a Delta Premier fee schedule versus a Delta PPO fee schedule is at best 10 to 15% difference in the state and at worst, potentially 30 or 35% difference. So let's say you buy a million dollar practice and half of that production is tied to Delta and that pool of patients, you don't get the Delta Premier fee schedule. You've got to take PPO and it drops by 25%. You just took a half a million dollars of production and you're going to collect 25% more of that exact same production than the person you bought the practice from because you cannot get what they had. What then, and you have to be willing to walk away from owners who are selling their practices that do not understand that because what they're not understanding is they look at their practice of here's the value of my practice. And they're absolutely right. If you can get the same Delta fee schedule that they have, if you can't, that practice is not worth the same thing to a purchasing dentist as it is to the selling dentist. And I understand, I, I get this all the time. There are markets that are so hot that nobody cares. They're paying for practices and they know that. And there's backup offers waiting regardless. I'm telling you, uh, walk away because it doesn't matter how much frenzy there is in an area if you cannot step back and look at real numbers. And the, if the real numbers say you are going to collect $100,000 less 
the day you walk into this practice every year than the seller did. If the only thing you do is replicate what they're doing, that's your salary. That's a hundred thousand dollars loss in your personal salary. The staff isn't taking a pay cut. Nobody else. The rent is the same. You personally are going to collect that much less. Now it's not, that's not the case in all States. Some States you can still be a premier only provider, but some States you cannot. And some States the like um, Michigan, there's if you are an older dentist, you have legacy fees, which means they're a higher fee schedule. Those are not available anymore. So the definition of Delta Premier fees is they're not the same thing anymore. If you uh, have legacy fees as an owner and you hire an associate, your associate cannot get the same fees that you have. It's just what you said. It's tied to you individually. And when was the deadline in your state? And, and where do you come in in regards to your contract? So you are absolutely right. That is, I mean, when this very first started in California, we worked with so many practices who bought a practice, had no idea that, that they couldn't get the same fee schedule. And back then, nobody would even knew it was happening. Brokers didn't know. Nobody knew. Until now, there's no excuse. You, you better know what you're buying. You, don't, you can't afford to make that mistake. But you have, when you're doing a purchase, you have to have actual consultants and transition people who know this. And you have to know when to walk away yeah, it, you it, have when to. the numbers don't work. You know, it's, it's always, it's it, for me, it's like two people are walking down the aisle already and it's very hard to stop the mm -hmm. wedding. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, they're like, well, we've already bought everything. Everyone's showing up, you know, we've already got a home in town. And I'm like, oh, yep. buddy, come on. And because now here's the first thing I would say is if you're watching this and you're a young, de young dentist and you're like, oh my gosh, don't let your ego get in the way. What Sandy's saying is true because you'll look at this and go, even after you look at the data and you'll go, I'm going to lose $100,000, but I'll make it up because I'm mm -hmm. better than this dentist. Look, you're going to have to keep the practice some a semblance of what it is for a little while because you just can't buy it and go, hey, new sheriff in town, everyone's gone. Mm -hmm. You know, so you got to keep that in mind. The second thing I want to ask you it too is on this very subject, even if you can get the Delta Premier by some slim chance, you get that fee schedule. It's not like that's just going to stay forever. There are states that are pulling Premier mm -hmm. to dentists that don't even have associates and go, wait, 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 you're taking my Premier? Why are you taking, I've been on Premier for, now that's, is that happening in a lot of states, a few states, uh, you know? Well, it's, yeah, it's every Delta's handling this kind of on a individual basis. And so you're kind of at the whim of just what does the change happen to look like where you're located once it happens. But I think you bring up a good point, which is um, any insurance company, any contract out there has the ability to lower your fee schedule. So just everybody does. You just have to know that's the case. They have to tell you they're doing it. And then you have two choices. You can either take the new fees or you can drop your contract. But you cannot force the insurance company to keep something in place just because you don't want to acknowledge that they're dropping it. You don't have that choice. So the other thing is, I think you're absolutely right. Even if you're buying a Delta Premier practice and you can get it now, like I'm in Colorado, you can still be Delta Premier in Colorado. So you buy a practice with that. But you have to remember, how long can you ride this train? right? Because it's going to change. So you don't know what your window of time is. Is it going to be a year? Is it going to be five years? You just have no way of knowing. And one of the things that, and I hear this a lot from dentists now, um, Delta, you cannot have all of your eggs in the Delta basket anymore. You just can't. Uh, you cannot assume that that piece, because Delta is usually the largest production source in a practice when it comes to all of the insurance companies. So in some states that could be 30% of the market, and it's still the largest production source. Washington State, it could be 70, 80% of the market. So it's varying degrees, but Delta is probably the largest production source. So you have to be thinking, how many eggs do I want to have in this basket? Do I start to do marketing and insurance contracts with some other options just so I'm spreading that out a little bit? So all of my, if, are you going to be only Delta Premier and that's it? Okay, as long as that lasts, that's okay. But when something changes, you're really exposed and you don't have any other new patient flow coming from other insurance companies to offset that. So you do have to do just what you said. Short term look at things and a big picture longer term look at things of where is this whole thing headed someday 
And it's it's not headed to where Delta Premier is going to be a, a, any bigger option down the road. It's going to shrink. Right. Right. And the reason I love Sandy so much is she works intimately with a lot of our practices. And the best way I describe it to a dentist who's on is Sandy's going to diversify your portfolio. Right now you have everything in gold. Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> you're investing everything in one thing, which is Delta. And you you did it for a practice just recently in Utah where you're like, okay, you're in too much of this insurance. Let's, mm-hmm. let's go to another insurance that you don't even know about. It's going to give you much more of a... Um, a, a good fee schedule that's more beneficial for your practice. That's really like you're taking a look at everything and diversifying their portfolios when you go out. And that's the whole point behind this actual topic is how do I reduce my PPO write-offs? We're going to take a look at everything. Mm-hmm. And then you make all of these adjustments, correct? Is that how you look at it? Well, right. Because if you are if you feel like, hey, 80% of our practice is tied to, to PPOs and that's a good fit for us, it's kind of where we, we want to be. Do you really care what the makeup is of that 80%? If you have 80% insurance patients and you can drop something over here that's a low option and get something added over here that's a higher option and you still got 80% of the practice but you've moved it around, um, what difference does it make to you all which insurance companies it is? You know, you just have to find the right mix for you. And there's a couple of insurance companies that are uh, getting a little more um, – almost offended when when dentists are dropping their plans. And one in particular, and I'm not going to mention it, but one in particular used to not have nearly the number of terminations that we're seeing now in the market. Well, if you decide not to increase fee schedules for two years and they're the very bottom paying plan, there's not much to say. Like, uh, you know, the the bottom line is in the same way insurance companies are looking at profitability, dentists have to look at the same thing. And if you've got something that has a $600 crown and your next lowest paying option is an $800 crown, you don't owe anybody an apology for getting out of that. Mm -hmm. Um, That is to your benefit to look at the numbers. And if, if insurance companies are not understanding that, yeah, if you're going to freeze increases and then wonder why people are terminating and get upset about that, uh, there's not, there's not much to say. <laughs> back right. To that. right. Now I know we only get you for so much time. We're going to have you back on other subjects, but let's say again, let's go back to our topic. If I'm going to reduce PPO mm-hmm. write-offs. And so, you know, we're going to take a look at our fees or our, our procedures, how often we do them, negotiate as much as we can. Any last thoughts that you would have on what I do next when it comes to that? Um, No, more so just really, if I was the dentist in a practice, the one thing I would say you need to start doing if you haven't is just once a month, take a stack of 10 EOBs and just look at them and look to see what am I getting paid with some of my larger companies? Because the thing that is getting missed a lot is that you might have a, a contract in place And that company may have gotten downgraded to another company and you have no way of knowing that it happened. And there is no shortcut. It's looking to see that's your paycheck. The EOB is your personal paycheck. There's just no way around it. You have to pay your staff their salary no matter what. Mm -hmm. But if that EOB has dropped, it's coming out of your paycheck. There's just no other way to look at it. And there's not going to be anybody any more motivated to look at their paycheck than <laughs> than you yourself. Right. And so you just have to stop and do that. You didn't used to have to do that. You you used to be able to know if I have a contract with this company, that's what I'm getting paid. That just isn't the case anymore. And so if you don't catch it, because remember, you're not even getting notifications when it's happening. So you can find yourself where like Emeritus is a good example. They don't pay on a, a direct contract anymore. So it doesn't matter if you have a great Emeritus contract in place. And it doesn't even matter if we go find you an increase on it. If you have a contract with United Concordia or Principal or Dentamax or Connection Dental and any of those fee schedules are lower, they're going to drop you down and pay you the lowest rate. So it doesn't matter what you've signed if that's not what you're actually getting paid. So you just, if I could say one thing, it's just once a month, just look at those and see what's happening with your paycheck. And remember, you can opt out of those if they're not working to your benefit, but you, you actually have to, you have to catch it before you can even fix it. Yeah, Sandy, that is just awesome advice. Now, um, 
for those of you that are listening on iTunes, you know, Sandy, if, if you're watching this and you're a dentist and you're struggling, you have a great resource, unlockthepo.com uh, forward slash contact us. You've got a little resource page. Can you tell us what you do and how you could help me if I'm a dentist watching this and I'm stressed right now? Yeah, it's more so just if you want help mapping all of that out. Mm -hmm. So go, a lot of offices do back and forth negotiations on their own. And we, we don't even suggest, you know, getting away from that. That's, that's a good thing for a practice to be doing. But the bigger thing that we typically help practices with, I mean, that's certainly a part of what we do. By default, we're going to go still try to negotiate for you. But the bigger thing is mapping everything out and saying, we're going to take a fresh look at everything. And we're going to figure out what do you need to keep? What do you need to get rid of? What makes sense? Let's get a timeline going here and just really look at adjusting all of your contracting to optimize things better with a, just a, a fresh look at everything. So that's the, the real piece that we typically do. So, so that part is where we're just going to look at everything. So if you, yes, if you go to our contact page, the th main things we're going to ask is, um, what contracts do you have in place now? And then we really try to give offices some feedback to say, okay, you've got enough going on. We could probably help you, but we also really want to identify look, don't spend your money on something that is not going to make sense for you. Here's a couple of things you could probably do on your own, but it, you don't have enough contracts in place that are potentially negotiable to really justify outsourcing this. So what we're really trying to do with that contact page is to say, tell us what your situation is, and then we'll get back to you if it gets you some information on, is this something that really somebody can help you with? Or do you just not have the right situation that it makes sense to, you know, really outsource this and here's some things you maybe could do on your own yeah that is awesome i'm gonna highly encourage you guys to check it out mm -hmm. anytime you see sandy on anything just sit in watch it she always <laughs> adds so much value to all of our lives and this is just getting so incredibly complex and it's i'm just so grateful to have you to help us navigate through all yeah. of this complexity so thank, thank you so me. much and yeah. i just have to say for anybody listening I kind of forgot to tell my staff I was doing this and normally we get those contact pages back pretty quick, but I didn't really tell them I was doing this. So now that I've given that out, just be a little patient with us. It takes us a day or two to get back to you because I kind of forgot to flag them. <laughs> Don't worry. It is so worth the wait. Every minute I get with you, it's awesome. So thank you. Stick around while we yep. say goodbye to everybody else, but thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed today, which I know you did, just do us a favor, hit the share button, share with your friends, keep sending us suggestions for things that you want to see. I would love to know if you watch this, what other questions or other things would you like to hear from Sandy? We're going to keep having her back and I would love to just bring you solutions to those questions that you have. So until we see you next time, keep watching. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day.